Welcome everyone to today's observability clinic, Kubernetes managed by Davis. Uh, it is March the 1st, uh, amazing, another month just started 2022. And as you can see here, um, Henrik grew a little bigger with cause of the pandemic because of all the food and less uh, the, the less exercise he's done. His image is so big that uh, there, was, there was no space anymore for my headshot but it's actually good because Henrik, you are the star of the show. Before I let you speak and take us through Kubernetes managed by Davis, again, some housekeeping notes. If you are watching this live, use the Q&A feature. If you're watching this recorded, you can reach us through the different social media channels, but you can also ask your questions through community.dynatrace.com. And you see a lot of other links here, uh, where it's easy to observable, pure performance podcasts, you can obviously, if you're new to Dynatrace, sign up for the trial and try everything yourself. But today is really about Kubernetes managed by Davis, our AI. And Henrik, I want to see what's happening, especially if I would be interested in Kubernetes observability. Um, I want to learn more from you because I know a lot of things have changed in Dynatrace over the last couple of months. And I want to see just how it helps um operators of kubernetes to figure out uh, whether the kubernetes cluster runs smoothly or not all right so let's start yeah all right without waiting anymore let's jump into the content so what are we going to learn here take take a glass of water some coffee whatever you want and here what you're going to learn if you think so first in order to get the context of why we are improving things at Danatrace, I want to tell you a story. So we're going to start with a small story related to a production outage that happens uh, a couple of years ago for a, a large retailer. And uh, behind that, uh, we will go through why it happened. So we will walk through a few reminders about Kubernetes um, on what was the main problem. And then uh, how could we proactively uh, accelerate the troubleshooting on that event. Well, uh, just put Davis there and Davis will help you to detect those issues faster and you could recover uh, even faster. And then last, uh, once we have covered uh, the Davis piece, um, so we will have two demo, uh, but I would like also then share a few, few things that you should pay attention to in Kubernetes and then we can jump to demo on on utilizing a few built-in metrics from Dynatrace and see how we can create uh, first a dashboard. And then of course, once we have the metric expression defined then we can easily uh, convert that into uh, an anomic diction rule or an SLO if you want to have SLOs more technical, technical related to your cluster. All right, so let's start. So first of all, this, I would like to uh, give some credits to uh, a talk that has been done in KubeCon um, so that lists the failures of this particular retailer. So uh, if you want to watch the other uh, problems that happens, check out that video. I have extracted one of the uh, issues that has happened for this company. And, and then that will, that will be the, the, the right uh, moment to explain and go further on why and how can we be more effective. So the story is simple. So it's a retailer. So retailer provides... Uh, you can shopping clothes on that platform. And one day, um, I mean, this company is, is obviously when you add product in the cart, uh, at the moment of paying, uh, the, the, this website provides you different payment methods. So uh, you can pay by, oh, this is, is up here. Uh, so you can pay either by, um, by a credit card, by uh, PayPal or, or others, and in particular cases for professional, I would say, users, uh, you have the options to pay by invoices. And the invoices um, is only available if, you if you're or, or a customer for a couple of years, that you are, have purchased several product, that you have no problems of paying those products. So behind to display the, the payment methods, there is a risk service. The risk service is here to identify the risk of the customer and depending on the risk, provide the, the right payment methods for the customer. And at the moment, uh, yeah, at that moment, 
what happened is that um, uh, the, the, the website was not able to provide any payment methods. So when you were paying, the payment methods were empty, <laughs> which is which is quite quite a, a, a very a big shame. At the uh, because at the end, when you are a retailer, you want to buy, you want to let your customers purchase and buy the product and pay for the products, and they were not able to do it because there was no payment available. And what happens? You can see here in the graph, the the graph in purple is in fact the response times of the the the, the risk service. So you can see that's quite unstable uh, at certain states. It was only not responding. So why happened? Well, let's check it out. So first, the, the, the logic is let's check the uh, HTTP response code. And as you can see, uh, at the moment of the incident on the risk service, um, they were uh, mainly before 2, 2x response time uh, response code. And at the moment of incidents, a lot of 5x, uh, 500 uh, errors. So you guess there's a problem. And then once they have extracted the statistics on the, uh, the error code, they said, okay, what is the actual error code behind that problem? And it was a 502. 502, for those not aware, it's a bad gateway. So which means something be in front of that service, uh, which could be a proxy or something, is not doing the proper job. So let's have a look at the architecture. Well, the architecture is simple. It's based on Kubernetes. Ha! Huh. No surprise for us today. But uh, in the cluster, there were several microservices. In fact, it's a multi-cluster architecture in this case. But um, let's pay attention to our risk service because this is the one that we're not working at the moment of the incident. So the in front of the risk service, as you can see, there is an ingress controller. So an ingress controller, to remind you, it's a way of exposing your services out of your cluster, but also defining some route uh, policies that will help you to route the traffic to the right service. And, but the ingress were not dedicated to that specific service, which makes sense. Uh, you can create several ingress rules where you can have a few, part of the traffic going through the risk services and others to other services of the application. At the moment of the incident, what really happened is that the risk services were not responding and because the ingress controller were dying. It will kill. In fact, the real reason behind it was an OM kill event. So when I looked at the issue, I said, what? I don't get it. I mean, OM kill event. First of all, what is this? So let's take a few minutes and remind how this OM kill event could happen. I mean, you all know in Kubernetes, it's an orchestration framework based that relies on nodes. And to help Kubernetes, there is a notion of request and limits. So here I have in this particular ski, uh, design here, a graphics that I have, uh, we have one node with four CPU and eight gigs of RAM. We have one pod running, fair enough. We, are, we have enough resources. If I deploy a new pod, the pod A, for example, I uh, define some requests. I need two gigs and I need, I need two, two core and uh, two gigs of RAM. So as a consequence, communities will try to find the right node that has enough resources to handle that new workload. So he knows the shape of the pod. He has an idea about, okay, it's uh, two CPU, two gigs. All right, now let's, let's allocate there somewhere in a node. So at the end, he finds the right node, the one that we're looking at. He knows that he has the space for that, that pod. So he basically at the end, it restarts and then we have the pod there. So that's the, the notion of requests. Requests, keep in mind, the request is a bit like uh, uh, Kubernetes is like a Tetris game, all right? So when you play Tetris, you have the shapes coming down on the screen and every shape has a different size or a different shape. And then you have to uh, move the shape around and create lines to green points. Kubernetes is doing the same thing. He takes the pod, he sees the shape of the pod, and then he tries to find the right node to create the lines and win points. But keep in mind, if you don't define the request like we just did before in the previous slides, what would happen is that you will have all the parts coming down will have the exact same shape. So then Kubernetes thinks that it's a small square, so it moves it, place it some, at one spot. But then suddenly the, the, the one simple square turns out to be a big, big shape because we discover that it needs more resources. So then... Kubernetes tried to be smart 
but he was not able to be smart because he didn't define the resources. We can even compare it, Kubernetes, to a box of chocolates. Remember when you were when you were a kid, uh, you open your box of chocolates, you pick one of the chocolates and say, oh, this one is, seems very tasty. You open the, the, the paper, you eat it, and then boom, there is liquor. Say, so, uh, oh, man, now it's different. But when you were a kid, it's different. Uh, you make some this, uh, and then you just say, I don't like that. So it's the same thing. So Kubernetes takes your pod. He doesn't know. He eats it. And he discovered that in that pod, there is some knickers. Oh, you're not very fair with Kubernetes. So let's be gentle and put the requests. Other thing, you can define any type of uh, values. The CPU will be expressing many cores and the memory in bytes. But if you define it in a very too high, your values, you're not sure about the value you should define. You want to put a very high value. You can do, you're free to do that. But keep in mind that Kubernetes will allocate those resources and then those resources will be never used. So you won't optimize the usage of your nodes. On the other hand, once you have the requests, so basically you have asked Kubernetes, say, I need the three room apartment. And then Kubernetes says, okay, so now you get the three room apartment, but you, you got a contract with me now. And the contract is that you're not able to consume that amount of power during the day. So you basically you have some quotas in terms of number of uh, the quantity of power that you can use on that apartment. So it's the same thing in Kubernetes with the resources. So you will define the limits, how much bytes you can consume in maximum and how much CPU you can consume as well. The, how it's expressed, very easy. In uh, the case of memory, it's in bytes. So here, if we do a load test or something, you can figure out how much memory you need in maximum. If you do in the CPU, it's different. It's it's the heritage of the container world where it's, it's shared resources through C groups and CFS. And basically it's ex expressed in that uh, particular parameter in time. How much time do I have to run my program within uh, a, a CPU period? A CPU period is 100 milliseconds, by the way. Um, but at the end, what happened, if you define not the right timing, you start to do some your, your run your task and then you have exceed the time that you were you had allowed in the cluster. So Kubernetes will say, okay, I'm going to pause you. It's not Kubernetes, but it's, it's Docker. Um, it's going to pause you. So basically your, your task has been posed and it's going to be resumed on the next period, which means as a consequence, that could have an impact, a significant impact on the behavior of your system. So if the, 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 the value are not defined properly, in one hand in CPU, you get some throttling, and on the other hand, if you not define the right value in the memory, what happens? You have overconsumed the memory allowed. So Kubernetes says, hey, you're not allowed, so I'm going to kill you. And this is where OMKill events happens. All right. So now we know OMKill. So it means that ingress controller were deployed. And at what certain time of the day, the ingress were consuming more memory than it was supposed to. I mean, how can an ingress controller consume more memory? That's a big question. I mean, it's a, it's a proxy, it's a pass-through. So how suddenly could it just increase the use of memory? Well, the answer is performance. Yes, performance. Because if, you're, if one of the backend services that uh, will take the traffic uh, of the ingress controller is for some reason slowing down, then the uh, ingress controller has to keep those threads opened and you will have more and more requests, but the requests are too, too slow. So all those threads are just increasing, 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 increasing. And at the end, more memory is being consumed. And this is what happened for that customer. So two lessons learned from that problem. First, the diagnose process was a bit low. It took some time to understand the actual problem. So it means we could be smarter if we had been alerted or had some systems that will tell us directly that, hey, we have problems due to this. That's the first thing. The second point is ingress control consuming more memory. Then, hey, guys, performance engineering, do some tests, validate, and then you will simulate that situation where one of the services is slowing down and you can basically uh, 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 handle or practically manage that situation where for some reason your ingress is going to be uh, consuming more memory. So let's bring the AI uh, to our observability to help us. So as a gentle reminder, you know, Danatrace has a Danatrace operator since several 
uh, seven months now, and we released the 030, and now we are uh, currently with the 040. And as you know, when you deploy the data trace operator, it will automatically collect metrics, logs, traces from the application where we ingest the agent, and the Kubernetes events. Kubernetes throwing so many events, and these those events will help you to diagnose. So let's use it. Let's be smart. And this is what we did. Over the summer, we have sent our Davis to the Kubernetes Performance Academy, the K K K P A. Uh, it's a fresh new school uh, located somewhere in the cloud, and we have tried to. Uh, uh, give to Davis all the lessons related to Kubernetes. And at the end, Kubernetes, uh, Davis went back to us and said, hey, I learned something, guys. If there is a CPU throttling, then there's an increase in response times. I said, wow, Davis, you're, it's impressive. You're a very smart guy. Um, and then we did the same thing. It says, hey, I discovered that if we have a memory limit problem, uh, it, there is an OM killed event, and that will increase the failure rates. Wow. I love that. So now Davis is so proud of the knowledge that he has that he is now able to take those two, uh, two information to correlate our issues. So if we have an increase of response times or increase of failure rates, then if there is an increase of CPU throttling during or compared to your baseline or an increase of memory, yes, there is a question here from... from from I, I love your stories, and, and, and if, if you've sent Davis to the cloud to learn more about Kubernetes events, maybe the next time you should follow him on that learning track and enable auto-correction on your PowerPoint slides. Height, CPU throttling. I'm just a, making a joke on the side because I always give you, I always give you a hard time on, uh, on some of the typos. The, the typos? But there's no typos. I don't, I don't see them. Oh, okay. No, that's fine. <laughs> no, but, but Henrik, I, I, it's, it's really fascinating. And I didn't want to interrupt you just for this. I also want to highlight, folks, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm posting in the chat. If you have questions, please use the Q&A feature in, um, in Zoom, uh, and I will moderate. But otherwise, I'll try to keep my mouth shut because it's more important to hear what Henrik has to say. Back to you. I know I see it height, height. So it's a height, it's a, not a high CPU throttling, it's a height CPU throttling. So keep in mind, uh, it's completely different. Um, all right, so that's, that was the thing. So at the end, what we get at, what, sorry, what would, what would you get out of that? So when you have a problem ticket where you have um, uh, an issue uh, in, in related to increased response times or failure rates, as you can see, it will try to find the right various root causes. So if you have any dependencies where potentially there's a service that's increased, it will also be part of the, the problem card. And then it will go down until we find a service. And if there is any uh, increase of CP core, uh, set, the CPU throttling, for example, it will be uh, provided uh, in, in the problem card as well. So of course you can jump then back to the various uh, communities screens that we have in our product or and analyze the, the metric anomalies as well. And you, with the logs, with the traces, with the pod and everything, in, in very short time, you will be able to understand precisely what it would happen if you were also having the similar issue that I just explained a few minutes ago. All right, now that we have this, we have a demo, demo time. This is a French demo time, right? It's the, it's the French. Then French demo time. And by the way, I wanted to highlight Alois Meyer. It's really funny. He said height comes probably from KLC high tower. So you probably <laughs> have, you added the T from uh, KLC's that, that, last yeah, name. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's the standard. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the standard of, uh, of Kubernetes. Okay. Uh, so our, what, would you have, what, what do we have in our environment? So we have a cluster, of course. A Kubernetes cluster, and I have defined uh, deploy several things. So I have Prometheus in the background. I want you guys to make Prometheus in this particular um, uh, demonstration. We have the online boutique. I have the uh, define. Uh, I have uh, deployed the NGINX ingress controller because I want to sort of simulate what happened for that customer. I have, of course, the Dynatrace operator, and to simulate uh, height CPU, <laughs> I have litmus chaos there. So I just generate a few, uh, few experiments, uh, but again, it's just to, to simulate uh, 
what the, uh, the the problems from from a Danetrace perspective. So let's jump into Danetrace then. Ah, interesting. And as you're getting a demo ready, um, I know you mentioned Prometheus. I wanted to highlight all oh, the beautiful dashboards. I will show you. I liked it. I liked it. Uh, and while you're doing this, while you're getting this ready, I just wanted to highlight. Um, uh, I know that links are not copyable from the, the chat. I'm sorry for that. And thanks for the reminder. I will make this uh, available later on. But Henrik has done a lot of previous sessions. And there's also one on Prometheus with Dynatrace. So if you are interested, go to the YouTube channel and I will repost that link in the chat. It's an easy link to type in, uh, search for Prometheus and you will also find more stuff on Dynatrace for Prometheus. Yeah. So this, uh, by the way, this, uh, this the, the, the dem everything that I'm demonstrating, there's a repo. Uh, that's a way of teasing the fact that in two weeks from now, there will be an episode for Litmus Chaos. So, uh, and this content is being prepared for this episode. So if you want to learn more about Litmus Chaos, stay tuned in two weeks, you will have some content related to chaos engineering. So let's start with uh, Dynatrace. So we don't have any major problems, but I would just remind you what is currently available. So in Kubernetes, of course, uh, if I uh, click on the infrastructure side, I will have the uh, various cluster uh, available uh, uh, attached to my tenant. And if I jump to the cluster view, I will have, uh, like we, we used to have since several months now, uh, a dedicated cluster view where you can see the cluster utilizations. Uh, you can look at how your nodes are behaving. Um, you can look at the workload. Also, you have the event card to show you what happens at the cluster level. But in my case, I want to basically focus on the one of the... Uh, uh, namespace, it's the hip to shop because all the experiments will be applied on the hip to shop. So I can jump in the hip to shop. From there, uh, if you have defined any uh, quotas, because I, I just remind you that in the namespace, uh, uh, for those who are not aware, you can define quotas in terms of resources and uh, number of pods that you, uh, uh, maximum number of pods tolerated in that namespace. Those quota will be reminded and you can keep track on this. So uh, the namespace screen is there also to, to, to also validate that the settings that you've defined make sense with your uh, environment. Of course, we have an event card. All the events related to the namespace will be there as well. So uh, in my particular case, what I was trying to fish here is to, uh, to stress this specific services. So in the case of the heap to shop, there is 11 uh, or uh, never mind, 11 services, but uh, one of them is the product catalog, which is a dependency of uh, the, the front end uh, services and others. So which means if I slow down or if I do impactful stuff on the product catalog, I may have consequences on other services. So this is what I try to do uh, over the couple of days, to be honest. Um, and here we can see the, the workload screen related to the product catalog screen, showing you, of course, uh, the, uh, the, the, there is various uh, drop-down lists to select which KPI you want to look at. So CPU uh, usage and request and limits. And in my case, I'm, I'm really interested in the memory and, and the throttling because it's, it's the, the story of today. So if I click on CPU throttling, of course, the graph will be updated. I will be able to see it. And here I can also do the same thing and I'm going to match for the memory. So then I can see uh, how far I am in terms of memory usage compared to the limits that have been defined. I can also, of course, click on to the on the pod level and jump to the, the different details about the pod. And the great thing is uh, if you have a, if your services has been instrumented by the one agent, as a, as a consequence, you will have the link to jump to the Danatrace services directly. So then you can take advantage of all the tools that you are probably familiar with related to your uh, to uh, more on the application side. So we'll do pure path, uh, service flow, uh, all the uh, dynamic requests. Uh, and if I click here, you will see. And we'll create the multi-dimension analysis. So this is through uh, that link. So there is a really easy way of to jumping back from the pure uh, apps and microservices section of Dynatrace to the pure infrastructure communities side as well. 
as you mentioned I also in those cards in those screens you will have of course the all the logs attached to that specific workload will be there and all the events will be there as well so this is basically to just remind what you will get uh, if you uh, if you play around with the uh, with the kubernetes screens uh, of course you can jump also to the, the to the level underneath which is the pod as well so now let's go back to our uh, story. So I have tried to generate some few errors. Um, and honestly, what I would like to show you is one of the problem tickets. So here we have one of the problem uh, that has been detected here is related to the front services. So you can see we have the front end services that has been impacted. And as a consequence, the root cause, uh, it says that there's a product catalog, which has increased. And if I expand here, I can go there slowly. And you can see that the it's tell you that compared to the baselines, we had plus CP throttled on that specific services. So then by having these details, first, I know that uh, there is probably some issues related to the settings that I, I may have applied on my workload. So I can either, uh, easily increase it just to, to fix the problem uh, very quickly, or you can do uh, any, any other stuff. So at least with that information, that helps you uh, to uh, keep track on the issues and problems, uh, especially CPU throttling could be uh, impactful for the response times, as, as we mentioned before. So that's for the, uh, uh, the pure Davis detecting problems. Um, I, to be honest, here I'm fishing through a simulation. I was trying to get you also an OM kill event. I was not able to do so, so I'm sorry about it. But I mean, if you have a production environment with a stable load and not a demo environment, it will be much more easier to generate your OM kill event. All right, so that's for the first piece of our content. So just trust Davis. Davis will help you and manage and detect your problems for you. On the other hand, what I like to do if I go back where is my slides I'm not able to click back here all right so now those were major problems and we discussed we we presented and we discussed about those major problems that could have happened in your production environment through Kubernetes settings. And uh, we've been talked about it in several observatory clinic. And now the great news is that Davis is picking it up. But there are other areas that we need to pay attention to when you where when we operate and we manage our clusters. And you, and you all of you know about it. It's your day-to-day -day, uh, job. And, and I just want to share a few uh, alerts that you should consider when you're dealing with Kubernetes. The first one, so here is the reason of this uh, colorful dashboard that uh, Andy uh, saw a few seconds ago. And I will walk through how you can build the similar dashboards. So Kubernetes, keep in mind, is similar to an onion. So there's several layers that you need to pay attention to. The first layer, of course, is outside of a cluster. It's our users. So we want to make sure, and this is what we discussed so far, failure rates, response times, and this could be a sign for... CPU throttling for uh, OM keel and other stuff. So the first level that we need to measure and, and collect from a Kubernetes perspective is application metrics. So response times and failure rates. Then we move on to the, uh, to the next layer, which is the cluster. So we rely on a cluster, that cluster um, uh, to let you know there is the master nodes and the worker nodes. So if you are in a non-managed cluster, you have the worker node in your hands, so you could get more, even more details and get more alerts related how your Kubernetes cluster is working properly or is healthy, I would say. So, but first, we can check that, is my cluster up and running properly? So for this, we'll see there is a couple of indicators that will help us to measure that. So this is like a switch on off, very simple. The second one is etcd. As you know, etcd is really crucial for, for uh, in, uh, in, in the Kubernetes world. So etcd, uh, it's a storage. So we need to figure out, first of all, if etcd is running properly, how is the storage for etcd? So a few things about it. So then we can also uh, first visualize it on dashboard, or uh, we could uh, get alerts that uh, etcd is running low. 
API server is crucial, of course, because we need it for deployment. We need for many, many things. So this usually, if the API server doesn't work, uh, first of all, you will be you will have trouble to get data. So you will be alerted in, uh, in, in a certain way. And last is kubelet. Kubelet is very important. Kubelet, you just know, is the, it's deployed on various worker nodes. Uh, kubelet will help you to deploy. So if suddenly you see that all your workload are taking a very, very long time to start, uh, that could be a sign of kubelet is running low or slow. So kubelet is also something that we could also uh, keep track. And there are a few indicators that will help you to, um, to, to follow and, and, and measure the health so somehow of kubelet. The other layer is the node. Node is obviously some infrastructure, so virtual or physical or whatever. So like we used to deal in a few, year, few years back, we need to make sure that the resources are there. So CPU, memory, of course. Um, if the, and also we design a cluster with a minimum number of nodes and probably a max, or if you have the auto, autopilot or other auto-scaling technology, you can figure, track, keep track the number of nodes that you're running with. But at least it's really important to count on the, the total number of, of nodes that you have, how many, how many of them are ready, which, how many of them are able to take your, your, your workload. So this is also a really important indicator. Then we jump to the pod section. The pod section is also very important. So uh, out of the, how many, uh, what is the percentage of pod actually running? Um, in, in the case of your workload, you may have basically you desire four or five pods and you only have two of them. That could be a sign of a problem. Um, and also if the pod keeps restarting, uh, keep track on how many the pods are restarting over the last 15 minutes. That could be a sign that if, uh, there's containers are crashing and restarting and restarting. That could be a sign of a problem. And though usually those problems could be easily resolved. Uh, and of course, CPU usage on the pod level. And then like presented before, everything related to CPU throttling, uh, it's not gonna be on the pod level because it's a Docker uh, constraint. So it's gonna be on the container level. So if you wanna, you need to keep track on the CPU throttling as well. The other source, like I mentioned, is more on the event sides. Um, sometimes, uh, I mean, sometimes <laughs> Kubernetes will throw lots of events and those events are usually a, a really good uh, sign to uh, start troubleshooting. So there are a few events that makes completely sense for you to track uh, on. Of course, here we won't have events based on our users. Uh, I mean, they could open tickets on your end, uh, support tickets, but you won't, you won't be, you can keep track on that. But here more on the Kubernetes side, I would say on the node, there are events that are very uh important so first node pressure it's a sign of a problem node not ready so the node is here but you're not able to schedule anything on it and then keep in mind that when you deploy uh, you could do services with node port or cluster ip those will allocate no ports or uh, allocate ip address as any systems there is a limitation so you need to check that there is no host port conflict the, that you have enough port on the machine yeah any ip address and so on and disk pressure of course um, and then on, on more on the pod level, we mentioned when kill, of course, crash loop back off is related to the fact that it's restoring very often. Um, and fail scheduling, fail scheduling is, is it's, a, it's a sign that something goes wrong on your, on your nodes, because if you're not able to schedule any of your workload, it means that one of the nodes, for some reason, is not running properly. Um, of course, eviction, we mentioned that on the previous observatory clinic. And of course, unhealthy. So unhealthy could be a sign, you know, there is a, a healthy probe in Kubernetes. So if you have a services that reports uh, to be unhealthy, uh, that could be a sign that something is not working very fine on, on your, your cluster. All right, so enough of talking. I have been talking enough a lot about uh, those events. Uh, so we're gonna create them uh, directly in, in, in Dynatrace. I mean, not everything, it could take a lot of time, but at least we will try to keep correct a few of them. Um, Henry, Henrik, before you continue, I just wanna highlight, first of all, thank you for everyone participating in the chat. Uh, also, thanks to Alois Meyer, who is one of our product managers, who is also active. Uh, I know he tried to answer one of the questions regarding Argo rollouts, but I think um, with the Q&A feature, I'm only allowed to, to do the proper 
uh, answering, but Israel, hopefully I got your name correct, Eva, Israel Chavez Herrera, um, have a look at the Argo rollout um, uh, answer from, from Alois. He was basically saying, yes, we are aware of that. We plan to also integrate other Kubernetes objects that directly or indirectly create pods. Argo rollouts is one of those. Um, and we don't have a current official ETA for rollouts, but it might come later in the summer. So this is from Alois Meyer. Thank you so much. And also uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew, sorry, hopefully I just have this correctly, Matthew. Uh, he's asking about uh, crash loops, job failures, persistent volume failures, pod pending delays, deployment glitches. Are all of these topics revealed by Davis? And I think, Henrik, this is exactly what you are currently uh, going through. Kind yeah. of what are we doing with these events? So first of all, I will I will uh, uh, let you know that we at the moment we Davis is not picking up all the events that has been listed here. It's picking up mainly we we started uh, with the, the one that has more impact on the application. So like I mentioned, uh, everything that could impact on failure rates and 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 uh, increase of response time. So this is the when kill and CP threatening that I presented. The other event at the moment we are working on it. So stay tuned. Uh, Davis will be even. He would be a first class citizen in in the in the Kubernetes environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's at the moment it's it's learning and will be better and better. And most of the things that we presented and we were create through uh, dashboarding or alerting would soon uh, be uh, managed directly by Davis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. So uh, just to remind you, we already explained it on uh, other uh, observability clinics, but to remind you, if you want to uh, take advantage or report anything related to Kubernetes events, um, there is a journey. Uh, and the journey is that you have to go to the log viewer screen and I will show you in a few seconds. So you start with the log viewer screens, you apply the right filter uh, to select only the event that you're looking for. And then you could create uh, of course, you can do a log event if you want, uh, but you can create what we call uh, a metric. So you can count the number of occurrence of that event um, and make sure to create to add enough dimensions because that will be very useful uh, to uh, when you want to split and do some 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 filter. Uh, so of course, the, the pods, the, the namespace, the service, the object kind, and so on. Those are very important. And once you have created that metric, Keep in mind that the metric will only exist from the moment there is a new event coming in in Dynatrace. So you create the rule, the rule is there, but the metric will only exist from the moment there is a new event coming in. So uh, don't be surprised if uh, you create the event and suddenly you don't see the, the metric. It's normal. You need a new event coming in to uh, to have the metric uh, officially created in Dynatrace. All right, another demo timer. Uh, here it is. So let's okay. Let's uh, let's jump into first of all. Let's start with the events, all right? Because we mentioned we just mentioned about them. So I'm gonna go to the log screens, uh, the log viewer screen. So in this, if you those not familiar in observe and explore, there's a log sections. If I cl click on the log sections, I will uh, open the log viewer and we'll see all the logs that is currently being ingested by Dana Trace. Uh, and as you can see, we have two type of event, uh, two type of logs, I would say, Kubernetes and logs. So log will be obviously logs <laughs> and Kubernetes will be events. So if I filter just the Kubernetes events, I will only see uh, entries related to Kubernetes. And as you can see, there is a, a labels or groups or object kinds. And those attached are uh, related to a few uh, a uh, few, uh, I would say, uh, community events. So here, for example, let's say I'm interested in the OMKill event that is here. Uh, so we have OMKill, in fact. Ah, there was a few hours ago. Um, so I have the apply the, the right rule that I need. Once I have this, I would be able to create a metric from here by click on this this one. And once I have the 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 create the the wizard to create the metric, I will cre create a name. Make sure to the you have to have the the uh, suffix the prefix called log doct. So then you can say Kubernetes Kubernetes up event when kill 
like this. And then here I will uh, obviously want to uh, count the occurrence of that uh, log record, and then I will be able to add dimension. So here, obviously, I want to be interested because it's a pod event. I will. Henrik, I to... just a quick introduction. Uh, interruption. If is it possible uh, to increase your screen size a little bit, meaning maybe in your browser, zoom in a little bit. Ah, perfect. Thank you. Just a little bigger helps. Yeah. Uh, so here I'm going to do pod name, for example, as a dimension. Then we can do like a service name. I'm, I'm not the. Uh, I'm looking for the the community service. Maybe if there is, I don't have it in that dimension. So maybe I can say cloud namespace. Here, DT, entity cloud application namespace. Uh, we can also add the cluster name if I want. So basically, make sure to add as many. Uh, as many dimensions as possible because it will be useful for you when you're going to utilize that metric for with your metric expressions. And you, as you know, metric expression will be there for dashboarding, for SLO, for uh, 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 anomaly detection rules, and, and others. So uh, oh, here it is. So let's create the rule. So now I just have to do save. Up. There it is. And now the metric has been saved. So that's for the, once we have the metric, we'll see what I will, I'll try to utilize it uh, in later on. We can then jump to explore data. So I mentioned several alerting that you may have to consider. So I'm going to do everything because we are lim uh, running low in time. So what I'm going to do is going to search for cluster. So I'm going to pick one metric for the cluster, for example, uh, one for uh, the nodes, and then I'm going to share the dashboard that I prepared today. So if you look at cluster, there is an indicator called ready status. So if I query that one, I can see that it's going to be one or zero. And the great thing is we report also uh, the dimension to the cluster. So if I, in my case, I have two clusters, so easily observable and perform. So I would have I will have the both lines available in the dashboard. And what I really like in terms of visualizations, uh, especially for, for Kubernetes or for to, to mapping the various objects is the honeycomb. So if I do honeycomb here, I see a one and one, everything is good. So then just for the sake of the visualization, I say if it's one, it's going to be green. And if it's zero, it's going to be a red. So now I have the, the metric just to say, is it up and running? It's very simple. I can add some label as well to figure out which cluster I'm referring to. Um, but again, you have the options. So that's for the cluster. The second thing is we can also, if I search here, so Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes, uh, no, no, sorry, I would say node. If I search for node, I would be able to, to have several, several things. I have the number of CPU available, the number of cores, so I can count the number of cores available uh, here, see the cores. Um, and there is another one that I'm looking for is the percentage. Uh, where is it? Uh, Use on the cluster, sorry. So cluster CPU available. So I can do this if I want as well. And I can run the query, boom. And I can split by cluster as well. So this is going to be global to the, the cluster itself. If you want to jump to the to the node itself, you can just do a simple calculation, uh, count the number of cores that has been allocated minus the core left, uh, minus the total number of cores, you will have the core left. And then you can divide it by the total number of cores, and that will give you uh, the right ratio uh, that will uh, uh, help you to, to, to validate this one. So uh, I'm just looking at the time, so it's only, only running fast. So I'm going to jump to the dashboard I've prepared and show you a few things that I have in that dashboard. So I'm going to switch here to half an hour. Does it make sense? And as you can see, I have tried to, to structure the view with first the cluster view at the top, uh, the node view on the second hand, and last uh, the pods, and last I have the application. Exactly like the various layer of the onion that I have presented. Uh, so I started with the, the, the cluster where I'm looking at uh, how many CPU I have available, the memory, so very high level of metrics related to cluster. And then here, this is what I do. I count the number of cores left in each of those nodes. So I can see that, for example, on the easily observable cluster that I use, I have only uh, I have only six percent of cores left, which is quite low. Um, so you can do that through calculation. So if you want, I can show you briefly the the, 
the the expression through uh, the data explorer if you want, but we can do that in Q&A if you need me. Uh, we can do the same thing uh, here. I'm, I'm using events, so node having system OM. So here, I, I, what I do, I, I count number of events that happens over the last 30 minutes, and I divide with the current value. I, uh, I, I remove it with the current value, and then I, I'm able to count the number of OM events that happens on a node, and I colorize the, the honeycomb tile through, uh, through depending on the values. Same thing here. I just report uh, the percentage uh, CPU throttling ratio. This is a great metrics uh, that we have. We have a ratio of CPU throttling uh, above 25%. It's usually it's considered to be a problem. So you could also here, like I'm listing, I have three pods that are currently the shipping services, the front end that is currently 20%. Uh, uh, so it's, it's uh, acceptable, but then we can see that we have several uh, pods that K6, I'm using K6 for my load testing here the ad services that is above the, the acceptable uh, CPU throttling uh, ratio. So you can also define that as well. So same thing here, I'm listing all the pods that I have restarted over the last uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So then you can keep track if there are major problems. Same thing for this one, pod running. So I, I count the number of pods versus the one that are desired. And if you know, I'm under the number of uh, expected numbers, I will have a, a red honeycomb for me. So it's, for me, it's just a way of visually, again, it's not, uh, there is no AI in here, it's just visualizations, but I, uh, with a, just a, by the look of the eye, because of, with the red color, you can have a sign that it's something problematic. Again, what I've defined in that dashboard, you can easily create it then uh, in, uh, through a uh, norm detection rules because the expression is there and just define the right thresholds for the. All right, now, uh, resume slideshow. So I have a few things to share before we uh, we close down this uh, observatory clinic. First of all, as you know, there is a lot of uh, uh, various systems that you use, Argo rollout or ingress controllers or anything. So it always makes sense to uh, uh, make sure that you push that metrics to the trace because then at the end of the day, uh, you can have uh, metrics, you can have traces, you can have logs. It's great to collect them but the, what, is, what you need is to contextualize that data. So then when it comes to Dynatrace, um, Dynatrace will be able to utilize that data properly to open tickets, to help you to define, to detect the root cause, to a lot of great things that we can do with uh, the data. So to remind, we have the, of course, the Prometheus ingest metrics. You are aware of that. So the, since uh, several, almost six, seven months now, uh, you can put annotations on your pod and then a trace uh, Kubernetes operator will uh, extract, will, will scrub the metrics that you have from that pod and send it over to Dynatrace. Open telemetry, of course, we have a support. So Dynatrace and Open telemetry work better together. Like I said, Open telemetry will provide you the three signals of observability, so traces, metrics, and logs, but you need to uh, push with the right context to take advantage of the data. So on open telemetry, you can either uh, uh, have one agent picking up the traces that you have generated if they are generating open telemetry HTTP protocol. Uh, if you have a, met, uh, your system that generate open telemetry metrics, you can also collect them. But if you don't have any agents or if you don't utilize the open telemetry HTTP protocol, you can utilize one of the component called the open telemetry collector and that collector will help you to either translate utilizing the right protocol or transform the data, and then you can interact with our API. So the metric ingest API, of course, the open telemetry trace ingest API, the log ingest, and so on and so forth. The collector at the end, it's a pipeline. Uh, so you define which source, where to grab the, the traces, uh, how to process that the, 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 the traces that you have ingested, and where to export it. So if you want to export it to Dynatrace, you will have to precise the path through your API uh, endpoint. Uh, same thing for the metrics. So you can also do uh, pipelines for traces, pipeline for metrics. And soon, once the uh, logs are in GA, we can do also open telemetry collector pipelines for logs. As of now, it's only traces and metrics, where you will be able to collect metrics, transform, and then send over to Dynatrace. 
And last to remind you, we also have the ability to ingest logs with any log agent in the market. And there is a the log agent uh, is there to uh, collect the logs from various sources, transform the logs into JSON streams, add annotations to it, uh, relabel it. And then once the transformation is done, you can send it over to Dynatrace. And for those who are not familiar, there is an awesome Dynatrace FluentD plugin that will help you to ingest your logs uh, in Kubernetes or in bare metal technology. So that's it for today. I think uh, let's keep at least 10 minutes for the q and I just want to, again, uh, take the, uh, two minutes to make a promo for the Is Deliverable channel. So there is plenty of content. Uh, I need your feedback. Uh, if you're expecting uh, other, other type of technology that, uh, that for, your, for your need or your project, let me know. So please check out the channel. Uh, that will be helpful from, from my perspective, for me at least. <laughs> All right, so let's jump to the Q&A. Uh, well, 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 Hendrik, applaud. It's amazing uh, how much content you covered in the last 50 minutes. Uh, a lot of questions that came in. I also special thanks again to Alois Meyer, who helped me answer a lot of the questions. Um, and I, I wanna cover a couple because a couple of things came in that uh, I wanna quickly brief over. First of all, the Honeycomb uh, dashboards that you've shown. This is not yet in a GA version, but I think it's coming either in 2.36 or 2.37. So that's just around the corner. I think it's with the next update and you also have the Honeycomb features in the dashboard. Henrik, then also the question came from Suresh. If you would be willing to share the dashboard that you've created, obviously it makes sense once the Honeycombs are out there. And as I said, it's around the corner. But Henrik, I, I think the dashboards that you built are great. Um, I'm sure they will find a way to share them. So... Um... So we're going to make a deal. If you watch my content, and is it then I will share your, your, your the dashboard. That's no, no, no. Just to be uh, serious, I can. We can. Uh, it's a JSON file, so we can easily uh, uh, export it in a public repository. So then you can easily import it and, and take advantage of this. And like I said, most of the dashboard I I have built so far is based on a built-in trace metrics, except a few events. So you will have to create the uh, log uh, event metrics like I showed you uh, at the beginning of the, the second demo uh, to create the right metrics uh, for the logging, for the event perspective. Mm -hmm. Then also there was a question around, regarding uh, one, I think it's promote, you were, you're not able to see some of your services. You mentioned that it is .NET Core, then I replied, you wanna make sure that .NET Core deep monitoring is enabled. How can you do this? Uh, because you asked me for the documentation link. Uh, I answer, let me Google this for you. If you Google Dynatrace.net core enable, the first hit is where it walks you through uh, the, uh, the settings page. Okay, so it should be, it's in the settings and the, monitor, in, in the monitoring section. It's just, you know, Google is also my friend or whatever search engine you like. It's very easy to find these things. Just search for Dynatrace.net core enable and you'll find it. Um, Hendrik, then there were a couple of other questions. Um, one was around metrics. Can we get all these metrics for our microservices? Yes, you know, once Dynatrace monitors your pods, your containers, and even does the deep dive monitoring, um, then you get all of the metrics you expect for the microservices, your response times, your failure rates, your throughput, and also from the runtime, your memory, your garbage collection, uh, you you get all of this right exactly. And, and, and one thing also I didn't mention because for them from the story that way I told uh, I explained it a few minutes ago, in my particular case what I did for those who are not f uh, aware, uh, Dana Trace is able to also um, uh, monitor or I would say uh, collect uh, metrics related to your ingress controller. So here in my case I have. Uh, uh, to find them uh, in my list here, controller here. I have the ingress controller. So here, this is the ingress controller. So uh, my entry service that takes the traffic is the ingress. So then if I looked at the service flow, for example, of the uh, from the ingress perspective, I will see that the ingress sends the, the traffic to uh, the front end and then the front end do whatever it is. So even on, um, uh, so uh, Alois mentioned that new Kubernetes objects will be also part of it, but at least if you're utilizing Ingress controllers to uh, manage the, uh, the, the the traffic in your clusters, make sure to uh, also instrument them. So then you will take advantage of all the features that we just presented today. Mm -hmm. 
Very cool. Uh, then there was a question around are there integrations available for ServiceNow? So yes, of course, if there are any uh, problems being detected by Davis or if you are creating custom alerts, then we have the integration options with ServiceNow and the list of other tools, whether it's Slack, Jira, PagerDuty, our own Dynatrace cloud automation, where we can then trigger not only a single tool, but we can actually execute sequences of tasks because this also fits to the question that just came in from Mathieu. Um, yes, you can, in case of a Kubernetes alert, trigger an auto remediation sequence where either you are triggering a single tool like an Ansible tower that does certain things, or you can trigger what we call a cloud automation sequence for auto remediation where we can call different um, in different of your tools through an event-driven model in sequence and between always validate that the action that was executed actually solved the problem. This is part of what we provide from cloud automation. We're not only doing a fire and forget and hope everything is good or asking you to build the logic into your automation scripts to validate if the system is back at a healthy state. We do this for you. So we call your tool, then we validate. If it's not solved, we can call another tool, another script. So we'll do that for you. Um, another question was around SLOs. Can we define SLOs on all the metrics that Henrik yes. showed today? It's wonderful. You know, what, what I, the metric expression is something that I, yeah. I, I used to love my wife. I, I still love her. <laughs> but when I started to play around with the metric expression of nitrates, then I said, wow, uh, every morning. <laughs> That's there, a tough topic. I know <laughs> You, you still, it's good that you still love your wife, but you love matrix expression even more. Wow. Sorry. Uh, no, no. So if I take, for example, let's take one of the, the, the dashboarding. And, and also I would like to be, make a big shout to uh, all the uh, R&D folks at Dynatrace because they're doing an amazing job for the support of Kubernetes and everything. And also a big shout for the dashboarding team, the metrics team, because there is always new functions, new display. So with the, the uh, with all the work that they're doing, you can do amazing queries. So here, for example, so this is a an expression that I made. You can see I have zero and one. So then, if I want, I can create an SLO. So I just have to go to service level objectives, add a new SLO, and if you do a new SLO, you can either uh, uh, define uh, whatever you want, or uh, you could basically uh, create your custom uh, your custom uh, metric expression, uh, so it's very simple. And so the metric expressions in SLO, I think has been introduced. Mm -hmm. when, when was it? Uh, two, uh, a while ago, and, and I just posted a link to one of my performance clinics with uh, one of our engineers. So the link in the chat is a link to a, a previous. Um, so even with the event. SLO, you can do it. Um, again, uh, when defining SLO, uh, yeah, try to uh, look at the uh, four keys. Um, but I think uh, in terms of uh, if you want just alerting, you can also create your custom anomaly detection rules. So if you go to alerting here, uh, no, not alerting, anomaly detection rules, sorry, you have custom event for alerting. So you can add here your custom de detections based on metric expression as well. So this is also something that you can consider. Mm -hmm. And then Mathieu is asking another question. Can I do horizontal pod auto scaling with Dynatrace and I double check with Alois Meyer? Uh, and he said, this is, there's, an, uh, there's an out of the box, no, but there is a, an integration that we have through D1. So if you want, if you're a Dynatrace customer, just reach out to your D1 team and then um, he can potentially give you some, some pointers. Well, let us know, uh, Mathieu, what you use. Uh, if, if you want to follow up on this, then I can also connect you to Alois Meyer. I think he's been, ah, here we go. There's a GitHub. I will send you a link. Um, perfect. I just got a project here from, and I, I think I posted in the chat window so that everyone sees it. Uh, this is another uh, repository from one of our colleagues, Martin Nittel, um, showing. And yeah, things. Martin Nittel, I, I already looked at the repo, and probably yeah. there will be an episode on it because it's covered Keda and other things. Perfect, so I think yeah. if you want to learn more about what Martin has been able to achieve. Uh, and explain in in uh, step by step. I will try. I will. I'm planning to do it. Um, perfect. I'm just fishing for time. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Hey. Um, let's see. Horizontal answered live. Um, 
I uh, met you, met you, that's good. Wim, oh yeah, I, I, I sh Wim, your question was around the metrics expression, what he just showed, that's great. And then we have one more, the, the Davis support for throttling detection on problems. Is it available from which one agent and SAS version? Ah, it's a good, uh, that's, because uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I, uh, we can. I don't have the answer here. Maybe uh, if Alois is still connected, it could maybe. Yeah. So the, otherwise, so we can get back to you uh, with the with the answer for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the question was around. I'm just. Uh, I have Alois here on the side in a Slack channel. He's just phenomenal. Thank you, Alois, so much for also supporting us here. Um, just great. See how the Dynatrix team comes together. Um, and Israel, right? If we. If you have a, and that goes for anybody out there, if you have any additional questions, because we need to soon close this session, um, always feel free to reach out to us. You have our names, so you'll find us on social media. But most importantly, remember there is uh, community.dynatrace.com. So I'm putting the link in community.dynatrace.com. This is where you find the whole Dynatrace community and you can post questions also in, in product chat on the top right in your Dynatrace environment. You can always reach out to the Dynatrace experts. So please make sure uh, to not forget about this. Yeah. And Alois also says uh, he doesn't have the version number on top of, of his head. He needs to double check. I'm sure we'll find this somehow. But I mean, it would be a great question, uh, Israel Chavez, for, uh, for the community. Good. Um, Henrik, do, can you do me the favor? Can you uh, bring up the, the, the list of links again that you had in the, uh, the slides? I have one at the end, don't worry. Let's put it then. You're reading my mind. Oh uh, yeah. It feels like I've, we've been doing this for a while. Oh, too, too, much, too much webinars. <laughs> too many, but hopefully good content. Based on the feedback we've received so far uh, from the audience, this is, uh, was very, very well received. and. And appreciate it, especially all of your effort that you put in here. I know. You, did an you can only imagine how much money I own to all those folks because I reached out and say, hey, you have to say this. So. <laughs> cool. Um, so, Henrik, yeah, any, any, any final words on yeah, this? Yeah, I just want to share, uh, if for those who want to learn more about Prometheus, because I, we went very quick on this because it was the main topic. Oh, I just want to remind you, we are open, we are able to collect any open observability framework. So if you, need, if you want to learn more about Kubernetes and, and Prometheus, there is a link to the performance link that we did together. That was my first performance link, by the way. I oh. think so too. And then we had another one with the open telemetry. Uh, so mm -hmm. this one is very really interesting. So keep a uh, look at the performance clinics. There is a lot of great content there. Um, there is a lot of online content on the training on the university. Mm -hmm. And last, uh, uh, there is the, of course, the Pure Performance Cafe that is uh, still out there and uh, with a lot of great interviews. Uh, so I will definitely recommend to listen to the pro podcast and ask, is it observable? Is it observable, exactly. And I just put some of the links in the chat as well. Uh, the slides, by the way, will also be shared on university. Right? The recording is going is going uh, out on YouTube and Dynatrix University and the slides also on University. And we have a promo to do. If you are in one month, in the 29th of March, so in 29 days, exactly, we have an Ask Me Anything live again. Uh, so if you want to learn about open observability and open telemetry, specifically in Dynatrix, how to get started, you should connect with us in the 29th of March. We will be live taking your questions. So don't forget to note your questions for the 29th of March. We will try to answer them with Andy as well. Mm -hmm. And also I just posted it on the, uh, on the chat uh, because Ramya is asking, uh, do we need Prometheus always for Dynatrace? The answer is no, mm -hmm. Prometheus is not needed, meaning Dynatrace will collect all of this data through our one agent and our operator, but, Prometheus is obviously an additional data source and you can use and get the data from Prometheus into Dynatrace. I would say the Prometheus exporters, you don't need necessarily the Prometheus server on your cluster, you need at least the exporters. Yeah. Very cool. Um, 
where you and Andy will be available. Where are we available? We are available in the closest bar of your choice <laughs> after five o'clock in the evening, Central European time, I guess. No, but just kidding. Uh, Luca, we are, first of all, located in Europe. Henrik in the south of France, me in the north of Austria. But I think the best way to find us is, um, do you have on... I mean, at least you have your name up there somewhere and your Twitter handle maybe. So here is the Twitter handle that I just posted in the chat on, is it observable? That's Henrik's- um, It's HRexet, the yeah, Twitter handle. Exactly, here's the Twitter handle on HRexet. And what I also do, Henrik, if you don't mind, I will just put our LinkedIn contacts as well. But yeah. really folks, if you have questions on uh, Dynatrace, you know, we are not the only Dynatrace experts, as you can see. We have Alois Meyer here and may, many others that help behind the scenes. So if you have questions, um, make sure that you are also reaching out to the Dynatrace community. Uh, but if you want to connect specifically with us, here are all of our links, both Twitter and also LinkedIn. Ah, <sighs> I'm thirsty now. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and I'm lucky, actually. I'm in the Vienna office today, um, in the office in central Vienna here in Austria. And I am going to meet my our friends from Triscon. Um, oh, say hi to them. I, I will. And they actually suggested a place close by um, that actually serve some good cold cervezas. Uh, that sounds like a plan. It sounds like it is a good plan. <laughs> All right, Henrik, thank you so much. You're welcome. Recording, thanks to John Rocker and Denise. Um, they will put it out there on Dynatrace University on YouTube. So big kudos to many people that also work behind the scenes that you never get to see. So John Rocker um, is just amazing for us. And uh, thanks for all the thank yous. Hopefully we'll see you at our next episode, which 29th of March sounds like a great date for the Ask Me Anything. And there will be other performance clinics or observability clinics like this as well. Enjoy the evening. See you. Au revoir.